Welcome to the new automation mindset where AI automation and integration come together. Successful automation is so much more than technology, it's a mindset. On this podcast, we're here to learn about this mindset from innovative leaders who actually practice it every single day. From Fortune 500 companies to the boldest startups, these leaders have reduced cost, crafted experience, and fueled growth with automation. They have transformed their companies and their careers. I'm your host, Marcus Zern, and as Chief Strategy Officer and part of the founding executive team at Workado, it is my mission to find these top innovators in AI, automation, and integration and share their journeys with all of you. You may notice that this show matches the title of the Wall Street Journal and USA Today best-selling book, The New Automation Mindset by Ao Workado CEO, Vijay Tella. You'll hear references to the key ideas of this book, the growth, process, and scale mindsets throughout the show. If you'd like to explore them further, be sure to check out the book in hard copy or on Kindle. For today's episode, I have with me uh, Pietro uh, Casella, and Pietro is a managing director and chief architect at EQT. EQT is a publicly traded uh, private equity uh, company based in Stockholm in Sweden. Um, So first of all, uh, welcome, welcome Pietro uh, to the show. And I, I thought we'll start with something a little funny. And you, you might okay. remember this, like, you know, let's go back to 2017. And I, mm-hmm. I saw this little graphic where uh, your uh, CTO uh, back then yep. basically said, you know, th- so we're, we're going back in time. This was before EQT was actually publicly traded. So you were getting That's right. already. And he had this vision to become the digital leader in in the uh private equity industry and so he said like look like uh, so i'm quoting here right now we shall automate everything we should be data centric use ai move to the cloud SaaS, use agile teams and we can break things and so everyone in the it uh industry probably gonna burst out in laughter and say like well good luck with that uh (laughs) the funny thing is you actually made it happen so yeah. uh, I'm I'm just curious to tell us a little bit like so this was 2017 I think you started you guys started using Workado like around 2019 I believe uh, yeah probably yeah how are things now uh, 2023 how did that journey unfold really curious yeah so yeah exactly so the the um, you know the context there is that uh, EQT was um, you know already a pretty healthy firm right um but uh, the the new CEO uh, had joined uh, you know a, a while back and um one of his main priorities for the business was to drive digitalization right so he made a few uh, key hires and and so the idea of digitalization actually was uh, coming straight from the CEO the ambition level was very very high so that that basically gave us a, a, a really nice let's say mandate to 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 be as ambitious as we could and, and so the the strategy the digitalization strategy has had these three components so one was like EQT as the poster child for the portfolio then we had like the um, the portfolio itself trying to digitalize it as much as we could and then the third leg was the mother brand which is these um, the the more r d so making our uh, investment professionals, the you know, as as super powered as as we could. Uh, so so we started with this idea of digitalization, and and there was a you know very like a lot of the key hires were you know I was coming from from Spotify, some people from Google, so we knew what good looked like, right? But here we we had to kind of basically uh, translate that vision into something. Uh, so when I started, uh, basically, um, yeah, we had like a classic setup. So everything on prem, a bunch of uh, ERP systems spread out. Uh, everybody was working on like the you know Excel and like uh, classic tools, um, and we had to translate that into into a strategy. Um, and we were trying to figure out what strategy means. <laughs> we we'll, we we'll, we can discuss that. But so wh- when you think about extreme automation. Basically, um, it, it's about creating a, a variety of building blocks. And back then, it was the RPA was kind of the the buzzword and cognitive computing and all these things. 
Uh, so, so we were very pragmatic. Basically, we said, okay, let's start by creating a surface for, for this automation and, and, and like small levers that change the culture. So, you know, we started rolling out Slack, Gmail, Dropbox, all of these things. At the same time, I was implementing, um, migrating all the ERPs into uh, NetSuite to, to like uh, have basically what I call remote controllability of the systems, right? And also we worked on our data because I, I believe that... Um, uh, this is not a belief, it's just a fact of life, is that, you, you know, data is the, 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 it's the big enabler of automation, right? So it's like the thing that you need to get right um, to be able to create triggers, right? So we basically started doing these things. And um, obviously, we had no clue if it would work. I mean, you know, the majority of ERP implementations fail. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, risk factors. So the only way to 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 approach this was um, with agility. So was you know we would do very short contracts with the software we selected. We'd say okay, I only license like three months, and I'll try it out. If I like it, I I keep it. If I don't like it, I don't uh, I don't keep it. Uh, so this allowed us to experiment a lot, to optimize for learning and for like iteration. And then obviously to to do this in a responsible way, what what we managed to do is also have you know really good uh, you know um, relationship with our uh, information security officer and uh, like uh, it's a, uh, you know like policies that make sense but they're not over restrictive that you uh, enable you to innovate uh, within the, the the correct boundaries. Yeah, and so we we, we did it uh, in a very pragmatic way, and now I think we are very very. Um, um, you know, pretty much it's embedded in us, this, this automation mindset. It's, it's, we're still not like complete and we did a lot of M&A as well. So there's a lot of, it's another podcast right there, but um, uh, yeah, it was good fun. <laughs> no, awesome. Awesome. Well, first of all, congratulations. So it's not, yeah, I think there's a lot of people who struggle uh, with becoming like this digital leader, as you said, like a lot of projects do fail and uh and uh, congratulations on 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 getting there to that uh, to that lofty goal. Now, now tell me a little bit. I mean, you've seen the Workado book, right? The uh, the new automation mindset. Um, it kind of talks about the growth mindset. I mean, it seems like that was almost the goal with the growth mindset, right? You know, to, like change it all up uh, and make it new. Uh, but it talks about the process mindset. It it talks about the scale. A mindset. I remember you guys doing hackathons actually quite uh, uh, pervasively with folks. Uh, tell us a little bit, you know, if you think about your journey to become this digital leader in the industry and you you kind of um, compare that with the, the concept of this new automation mindset, like growth mindset, process mindset, scale mindset, like what, how does that align? I, I was reading the book and... Um it reminded me of one of the key principles I use when I choose uh, software um, is I, 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 I tend to prefer software that is opinionated. It's like, like software that tells you how you should run a process, right? And uh, there aren't many out there, you know, people tend to, to try to do this very horizontal kind of, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to use the bad word, like van vanilla kind of surface, like the vanilla flavor software. And and that is 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 uh, complicated because if you're automating a process, um, you know maybe you automate the process once in your lifetime. Maybe you see the same process twice. You know, so so it's very hard to decide what to do. So I really enjoyed kind of um, uh, that about uh, about uh, your platform. And and uh, it's funny that you ended up writing a book because those principles that the platform already had baked in um, were kind of translated. So you. Can, it was kind of the you know thermodynamics when you when you you first invent the train and then you invent the the theory, but in this case that actually worked quite well, right? But so uh, when when you make these choices, you basically you get a lot of innovation for free. So you 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 buy the software and then it it kind of uh, works. But um, you know the, the 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 book talks about these uh, you know these, these three dimensions. So the the idea of how you set up the architecture, so this whole kind of the structure of the process, the data, the people, all all of that stuff is is really the essence of architecture. So at one point when I was drawing architecture, um, the thing that helped me uh, is I had like literally my diagrams had four colors, which were these these four dimensions: process, people, data, and system. There's a bit of redundancy, but I wanted to really separate data from system. Uh, it was quite important. 
Um, and, and that enabled me to kind of look almost like a Rubik cube. You, it's like you, you change, you flip the perspective. It's like, okay, how does this process affect the data? Oh, but which people are using this process? So we, we did a lot of this, uh, um, this type of thinking. So that was kind of baked into the culture and how we described complexity. You know, we, we were looking at processes to automate. The first thing we had to do was give them names, you know, like what's the name of this thing that you're doing every morning? And, and most people cannot name the, the stuff they do in companies, right? So that is very important. It's like that type of structure. Then the, the plasticity, I love that word, uh, is this permission to change. And, uh, you know, at Spotify, we said, uh, you know, like move fast, break things and, and but but uh, effectively is is this giving yourself permission to change your mind right and many companies fail like this they they, they choose a software they make a very large you know uh, bet on something then they realize that thing does not work for that platform um but they just uh, continue to you know they it's like the cost of uh, in, you know the the sunk cost fallacy or whatever it's called it's a uh, they continue to bank the, you know, the, try to make something work that is not the right fit. So I think uh, we believe in trying things out um, and and learning, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, and then finally, there's this other dimension of like democratization. I think usually this is word is is used to describe uh, the process of um, empowering your employees, like the let's say the functional people. And I think that's kind of the goal, uh, but um, very few people speak about the democratization inside tech, right? Inside your technology department. Um, and so if you have, let's say, the, the CRM team and you only allow them to work in the CRM, they, um, and, uh, they don't know the, that it's possible to do a lot of magic tricks outside of the CRM, right? They, they, they're not, they don't know they have permission to touch the database, right? Or, or to do automation. So they tend to build this spaghetti ball inside your 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 CRM uh, without realizing that if they step outside, actually it's quite remote controllable. So if you think about Salesforce or something like that, so we 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 basically when we rolled out the the, the automation platform and the data platform, we basically left you know we said everybody has the keys to it, everybody can use it inside the the, the technology department. And um, and that led to you know people finding much much simpler ways from an architecture perspective to solve the same problem, you know something that would take a bunch of lines of code um, uh, to do in, in one of the systems would be very very simple to do outside. All the authentication, all that stuff is taken care of for you. You just need to like connect the dots and build the logic. The same with the data. So we 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 are big uh, DBT um, you know early adopters, and uh, you know the fact that everybody can just access the data of other systems through the the data platform enables you to create you know a level of innovation that is uh, you know very hard to achieve in other ways. So obviously this this was a great idea, but then um, you have all the scale problems, you know, and and uh, unfortunately the data mesh was only invented like this year. <laughs> So we, we found all the pain points of not having that concept. We worked in like a monorepo with centralized uh, responsibility. Then we decided to split it out. So there's a, tons of details in all of this. But the, the fundamental principles are, you know, picking up these, these, um, these very um, easy to understand systems and paradigms and then just build stuff around it with, uh, and, and letting people innovate, let them just do stuff. Um, and yeah, it, it works pretty well. So I think the, um, we we truly, I, I truly think we embody a lot of these principles of the of the book. I, I'm happy to say that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually. It, it, it's really interesting. You said um, you know democratization within tech, right? Uh, because I do believe, like people somehow when they hear democratization in software, they they almost assume they 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 jump all the way is like, well, does that mean that the end users are now building the software? And I think that what they're failing to see is that there's actually so much opportunity of democratization within the IT team itself. I mean, we when we launched yeah. Workado, we actually first launched it only to Salesforce administrators in the first six months. And really this okay. was, we, we, we felt like, well, an app, it, just in general, an application administrator 
that mm -hmm. felt like someone who should be able to do integrations. Actually, actually, they've almost validated it. They they looked at Mercado and they said, "Hmm, this looks just like Process Builder, which is the workflow engine within Salesforce, only that it goes across all my applications." And we're like, yeah. well, that's exactly what we mean. It's like, it's, it doesn't have to be a compartmentalized separate group that does integrations. No, I mean, you, yeah. I think these people, they should have a much more holistic uh, view across Agreed. things. So, so yeah, I, I, I would say that's really, really key for people to understand. Like, don't, don't overreach with the democratization. Like, just try to, no, exactly. just try to, to, to make little steps and, uh, and get it going. Yeah. Uh, and I mm. think there, there will be, um, there's now a new era of democratization of of um, you know building stuff uh, that that is led by AI basically. So uh, today, um, you know, if I if I want to build like a full stack application and I you know I need to use like this fancy new database, I can literally just um, you know spin up an AI and just like figure out how to use that in like no time. So the idea that um, you know one team only works with one system um, will no longer be because everybody will be able to do everything. And I think that's very, very cool. Uh, but, but also on the, um, on the, the, on the, let's say, end user side, um, we are seeing the first cases of like, uh, you know, deal professions that know how to code really well and they, and they build solutions and we just need to, you know, we could just like stop that. But our, our approach is really to say, oh, great, you, you want to code? Let us give you an environment to do that. Uh, and let us show you all the data that we have here so, so that you can have fun. Um, and, and that is a, quite an interesting uh, transition that, uh, that is quite unexpected for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we, we, we'll get to AI. I I I promise, but <laughs> but <laughs> I know you can't you can't hold it back. I know it's going to be a really interesting conversation about AI. But I I, I did want to I did want to mm -hmm. start with data. Because you know, okay. I, I and I, I know you. Data is really important mm -hmm. uh, to you. Uh, I do mm -hmm. think that data is kind of the foundation for all the generative AI kind of work that's uh, that's going on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit um, about EQT. I think you guys have the ambition to be maybe the most data centric private equity firm out there. I mean, mm -hmm. there's this mother brain, which is, first of all, a cool, really cool mm -hmm. name. But <laughs> it, I think it's also very uh, uh, special. Um, I mean, if you think about, you you probably know uh, Moneyball, right? The book Moneyball that talks about mm -hmm. using data in, in, in sports. Uh, yep. I would say that you guys at EQT, this is the real money ball. Now we're talking about investing mm -hmm. money and, and, and doing that uh, data centric. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the mother brain and, and tell us also a little bit how you think about data and what you think the audience, people who listen in, what, what, what do you think can still be done with data uh, in, in, in enterprises out there? Yeah, so the background story of, of, uh, of mother brain is uh, when we launched our ventures fund, um, we thought of building the first ventures fund that was kind of fully sourced by data right that was very clear for us in terms of, uh, of vision uh, so the um, the first let's say iteration of mother brain which uh, which we pursued for for many years and we still continue to to develop um, was this data platform for 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 sourcing deals but um, also a, a I'm gonna call them like a set of rituals for how the 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 the, the ventures team operates right so you have this platform that has all the companies in the world that has you know certain automations like scoring companies according to you know signals that we believe are um, good indicators of something we should look at it aggregates all of this stuff um, but then it's also the fact that the team goes there and looks at this and and gives feedback and and and, and you know like thumbs up or thumbs down a deal and um, and provides information about why they like this company or not, right? And that evolved over time. So we had, um, you know, as you do it, you start realizing, oh, when we speak about a company or when we report on a on a you know meeting we had, uh, we actually identify certain metrics. So we, you know, maybe this the the the, the CEO tells us that they're growing twenty percent, or and and those nuggets um, are all 
stuff that we can actually capture and, and, and save, right? So, so we did that. But, but over, over time, you know, that, that was successful, um, but the, the private equity business, um, so the buyout business grew tremendously. And um, it made sense for us to start uh, obviously thinking about how to bring that same kind of approach to the rest of the business. But, you know, if you want to buy, let's say, a fiber company in France, you don't need an AI to figure out who are the targets, right? They just Google and you find it. So um, the let's say the problem statement kind of shifts a little bit. And so you need to re- basically rethink a little bit what's the, the, the right way to do this. So when I joined the, the Mother Brain team, so I was, you know, I spent f- five years doing the, our own transformation, all the automation, then I moved to the Mother Brain team. We were basically building this new capability that would kind of approach the, the, um, the private equity side. But by then we had learned so much about all this, this data and all this, this volume of data and how to, to use it. Uh, but we, we wanted to try something a little bit upside down. So instead of working on the data before, uh, you know, like as a stock for an experiment that might come in the future, we flipped it around and we said, every experiment starts with a question we want to answer. There's actually a famous blog post a few years ago called Questions to be Answered uh, as a, a pun on the um, jobs to be done idea for processes. So these questions to be answered says, okay, you always start with a question and then you backtrack and you go figure out which data you need to, to answer that question, right? And so uh, we had, basically we built the setup for that. So we, we prepare the data so that it's very, very easy for an experiment like this to happen. Uh, and then we have these super vertical, like full st- full stack teams that can, you know, work on on the business side, uh, you know, understanding the question, but they can also like code a scraper uh, in the same day. Uh, and these teams basically engage uh, with uh, with the deal professionals, and they work together uh, on finding um, the solution for these problems. Right. So not only we can do very very different projects, so we can do things like M and A search, or we could do like a geospatial analytics for, you know, where should you open your next uh, charging station, things of this type, um, or, you know, like looking at patent data and answering some question about upcoming pro- um, products. Uh, and um, and it works really well. So the I, I like to say that the second iteration of Mother Brain is really an operating system. It's like a, a way of working uh, that is very much the, the plasticity element here. With a couple of interesting, pro- I think you have this expression. Is it anti-fragile? The, the an expression on the book, right? So I, I love when I when I read that because it's um, one of the things we do is like every time we do one of these experiments, we start from scratch. So every software we build, we we throw it away, and uh, what this does is it allows you to try different ways to solve the same problem over and over, right? as opposed to building a platform that generalizes the problem uh, and democratizes how you approach the problem. So one example of this was the, the, the M&A search tool that we have. So we do a lot of M&A uh, uh, searching. Uh, the first version was you know, converging to be a really nice, let's say, data exercise in filtering. But then December last year came and in like first week of January, we had a new version of that tool with the uh, with the uh, language models, basically with uh, vector search, and it it was so much better than the previous one. We had no idea this was possible, right? This is only possible because we were not attached to our previous version of the software. We we never spent any money maintaining that because everything was kind of disposable. So th- this this type of um, let's say principles that we are incorporating in how we build things for me are like the the the, the essence of uh, of uh, what mother brain is today and and the goal for us is really to continue to expand this and uh, we say it's to to make EQT the most AI literate organization in the world uh, through through these types of exercises that's that's kind mm-hmm. of how we're thinking about it no, perfect. So, all right. So we talked about the mother brain, which is fascinating, I think. Uh, uh, I think and we, uh, we're taking the route into AI. So you got this uh, mother brain and now you're using not just keyword search and something, you know, you're using semantic search. You have LL and LLM, you have a, a vector 
a, a database. Um, and then I saw in January, you when I think this was kind of probably before most of the world even knew that there was open AI, um, you published an article, a blog article uh, around uh, uh, AI and being the next frontier and so on. Um, and if I read that article today, I was like, oh, wow. I think Pietro knew a lot more back then than maybe most of us know today. And, and, and frankly, everything that you wrote, I think, is, is very much applicable. I, I would recommend everyone mm -hmm. to look on, go on your LinkedIn, find that article, uh, read it. Yeah. So obviously, you guys spend time uh, with, uh, with these LLMs and, and, and so on. So, so tell us a little bit like your journey and maybe, you know, what I'm most interested in about is... What do you think are the killer apps of Gen AI? Because I think most people today are doing the little things like, you know, summarizing yeah. text and, 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 and so on. You know, you brought up the whole vector database, you know, knowledge management. I have a feeling that there's something there that most people don't see yet. And then, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the rest later, but tell us a little bit, uh, um, what do you think are the killer apps of a of Gen AI uh, in your yeah. opinion? And you know what have you learned in these like last twelve months? Well, I, I think the um, the AI uh, the imp the impact of AI is will manifest itself in many different ways, right? Um, and um, that is actually the challenge I have when I speak with uh, you know leaders in our portfolio companies. Um, is to un unbundle all of these different uh, speeds of, of uh, innovation, right? Uh, so, but uh, you, you mentioned uh, like killer the concept of killer app for me. For me, this the, the way how I speak about it is, is basically that you have multiple, let's say, stages, right, and multiple um, versions of of AI innovation. So the basic stuff is what I think is Gardner. They call it like everyday AI, right? So. I think that's in a way a killer app because um, it's like free money. If you're a developer, you install this thing, it's 20 euros a month and you just get better, right? In my case, I, I wasn't coding uh, like regularly for some time and now I feel like, you know, like I have this uh, injection of energy, I can code again, like everything, right? So it's, I think it's, that's very, very interesting. Then, um, so that's a baseline. I think it's a, a new category in itself. Then you have things like AI uh, featured companies, as we call them. Uh, I think AI featured uh, is is um, a transition technology towards something much bigger um, that will that will uh, um, you know happen next, which I call the AI native companies, right? Um, and and I'll tell you the difference. So some. Um, let's say automation uh, products that are coming out, um, they look at things like RPA. So there's people training models that can look at a, at, at a screen and figure out where to click the button. While that's interesting, um, it's, it's kind of a very complicated way to do it if you have access to like the underlying systems, right? The, not only that, but also the, the, the applications that these systems are trying to use were built primarily to avoid human error, right? So if you think about the code base of an ERP system, 90% or like 80% of the code base is effectively workflow management for users to hand over work between themselves. So if you ask, the, and, and, and I'll come back to your question, like if, if you ask yourself, um, how, do you, how would you build something like that today? assuming that you'll have AI for granted, probably you wouldn't build all that machinery for, for the human side, right? You would probably start uh, in a slightly different way. So when I think about the future, and I always try to think, uh, you know, at least a year ahead, um, I'm, I'm looking at that phenomena. So what will happen, um, um, you know, when people start rethinking categories? So, uh, uh, you know, you use the word killer. I, I prefer to, to think about the replacement technology and the new, let's say, the new iteration of every single category. And, and also, you, don't, you cannot look at it just with the AI lens, but also with the other trends around this. So you have like da new databases coming out every day. You have multimodality. You have, uh, you know, VR and real-time uh, databases. So I think when you bake all of that together, 
you will have people that will take all of it, like engineers, like, you know, that, that will just say, hey, I need to build this from scratch. Um, so that excites me a lot. So back to your question. So what are these, these emerging categories? So you see people, a lot of, um, let's say, software that is addressing a single task, right? So they look at a job and they say, hey, here's like, seems like you are sending an email every day. I'm going to automate that task of sending that email. So that is kind of the first version. Then the second would be something like a worker automation. There are a couple of startups now that are creating like an AI lawyer or an AI, um, um, you know, accountant or whatever it might be. Um, the issue with those, uh, with some of those is um, the, what I've seen is that they, they take care of the, like the communication side of it. It's like sending like a, a marketing person that sends emails, right? But uh, that marketing person is also updating the CRM and doing a bunch of other stuff and like booking rooms and and so so the job so the the idea of automating the worker and the combo between that and the software that supports that process is is like the next level for me. So I think you'll see after we automate some some workers I, I think the focus will actually be on automating a full business process so taking let's say your finance function and reimagining from scratch what what should be like the the next generation ai function right that implies basically starting everything from scratch You're like okay being opinionated okay what is what are all the steps that i can automate and what should be the job of the the finance function once all of that is automated and so you'll basically start from the from from the bottom up with the, by designing the the brain the decision making part of this first and then you figure out okay so now i have this ai that knows all the us gap and all the the accounting standards what are the like the the buttons i need to put around it for 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 it to do its uh, job and then you can continue this exercise. So my my next step would be like full self drive mode. So what is the ERP of the first one billion dollar company that has zero employees? Uh, so that's that's something I would love to build. You know, like a full self drive mode business with with AI inside of it, like just doing all the customer support, all the billing, like the you know the the returns, the accruals, the stock management, uh, marketing, that, that will be pretty cool. And I'm pretty sure someone will build it, but it's, it's going to take a bit longer. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it's not something you, you build on a weekend like most of the apps you see out there. So that, that is the cool exercise that I'm excited to see. So if anyone out there uh, knows about uh, anyone doing something this big, uh, I would love to just discuss and understand what it is. Perfect. Perfect. Well, let's talk about this. So the, I think, I think you uh, made a great point about, you know, one step taking that AI and then infusing it into uh, an end-to-end -end business process, right? I think that's a, that's a really important step. I think you're famously quoted also on the internet about challenging people, uh, you know, use AI to, to produce JSON, output right which is effectively you know once you once you produce json with uh with an llm i think now it's almost uh, to me the analogy is like now that digital brain actually gets arms and legs it can actually do things because json is like you know an api can now take that json you can you can work it into uh whatever systems whatever needs to uh to to happen um you know we had a little conversation around you know the old business rules engines and what AI can do to that. You want to you wanna talk a little bit about it? I mean, I, I'm super excited yeah, yeah. about it and it seems like you were too. Yeah, so w back in uh, you know December a year ago when I first tried ChatGPT, what happened was that I, c I couldn't sleep for three days and then I called my, 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 my friend uh, uh, Patrick and, and we, we ended up like brainstorming about this stuff. So back then what was happening is that everybody was trying to bully the, the AI into saying like uh, racist comments or, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on like uh, jokes and the text generation really, that was really fun. Uh, but for me, the, you know, one of the first things I did was, uh, was actually the JSON thing. It's like, hey, 
if because that's a problem we've been trying to solve for eight years. We were trying to do entity resolution, trying to predict things like the sector of a company at scale. So I said, hey, w maybe I can use this to enrich data and to uh, you know drive automation. Um, and so when I saw that it, that was possible, that you could instruct this, um, I started thinking about like all the, the possibilities. And, and as you said, I have a, I worked with uh, business process management for many years and uh, automation. And, and, uh, and one of the categories back then was actually the business rules um, engines. So these were systems that um, the, 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 the concept of these systems was providing a user interface for a business user to maintain the rules. So for example, if you're a telco and uh, you have a certain um, you know, promotion you wanna launch, um, you wouldn't wanna have that business logic coded in all the systems. You rather wanna centralize it so that every system just asks, hey, what is the discount for this user? What should I do? Uh, and so, funnily enough, they would you, you would model these systems as a you know as a configuration, but then they would produce a textual representation of that config. So you'd say if this, then that, um, and then it would generate uh, when Pietro goes to da da da, he shall be charged this. So, and now the exact opposite happened right which is like i would never predicted this which is you no, you actually you were wrong you, you should start with the language and then generate the the rules and that is very very there's like all these things that just make you think upside down everything you believed in um so yeah why am i excited about this so i think there there are a couple of archetypes of um of applications that are emerging and um, you know you have a generation use cases. You have conversational user interface. You have things like search, super super killer app, the, just speeding up the search of images or anything. And then you have these things like agents. And uh, a lot of people, actually, a friend of ours uh, is doing a company called GPT Engineer that is um, basically coding autom like uh, automatically coding of an entire code base, right? It's an, uh, an open source project. What I don't like about that approach is that I would never feel good about uh, deploying that code in a in a like a enterprise environment, right? Actually, I don't think my CISO would let me do it. <laughs> you know, just like leave some code running by itself. Um, it it creates a lot of problems. Also, you know, I've been an engineering manager for many years at, uh, before, and so you know, there's a tons of problems around like code quality. People think about the quality when you write. I always think about the poor person that needs to change that code three years from now, actually, you know. So the ease of um, modification after the person quit, uh, it's, it's a big deal. So when you're, when you're building an enterprise architecture, you need to consider all these things. So as I think about AI on the enterprise, which is the main focus, um, I'm excited about these, um, you know, these archetypes around automation, basically. So coming back to to that. So, how what what is a nice way to do to do this? So effectively, you can prompt the um, the AI to to generate a JSON format that your web service understands, um, and provide it with a lot of rules in text, right? And and most of the time, it will actually get it right. So with this, you're doing two things. One is you're replacing the business rule management system, uh, but at the same time, you're restricting the degrees of freedom of um, of your uh, AI. So you basically, I think we you, we spoke about this. Is you're you're basically giving three buttons for to the AI, and this AI is like super smart, but it can only click one of these three buttons, right? When you do that, I'm pretty sure you can put it in production. I mean, the the you know the the, the likelihood that it goes rogue, uh, it's it's then very under control. But then once you do that, basically, uh, you know, as a, an architectural like um, um, archetype or pattern, then you can build all the all the stuff around it, like uh, governance monitoring. Things like caching, you know, you don't want to be calling this AI multiple times if you have them, like memoization, like if you have the same input, you shouldn't be calling the AI again and just throwing away money. 
logging and then it's like feedback loops around data enrichment so then it gets really win interesting but i think you know when, when you're architecting something like this you effectively need to create some form of um yeah like happy path for how to use it and i think this one is actually quite uh, quite uh, elegant uh, and the funny thing is that as I was trying this, then um, um, three months later, uh, OpenAI launched the Functions um, API, and then uh, more right now they launched uh, you know a, a fine-tuned uh, version. I assume that that actually only generates JSON, which was one of the problems we had before. Is that you would ask for JSON and you say, "Oh, absolutely, Pietro, here's a JSON," <laughs> and then the JSON is no longer a JSON. Um, but now they fixed that. Um, so yeah, I'm happy I kind of predicted a couple of uh, weeks ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, very very nice. And and for the audience here online, if uh, if that kind of gets you excited, um, you can actually try this out. So uh, we have at Workado an accelerator. We did it first within the security domain as a security workflow engine, a SOAR engine. Uh, so basically, I think there's about 10 tasks, so 10 buttons, as you described, 10, 10 kind of tasks that this uh, smart rules engine can, can execute. And using actually the OpenAI functions that you mentioned, uh, and now you can actually also do that with Google Vertex and, and Bedrock and the other ones as well, but OpenAI was first. Um, basically, the so the, the 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 different the ten different buttons are implemented as as workado recipe functions function recipes right and then uh, and then the uh, the openai functions uh, basically pick which one to uh, to execute and then in what sequence and so on and it it's remarkable so we took it. It works extremely well in the security domain. We're actually, as a next step, we're kind of generalizing it as a as a generic like process variant because obviously it can be used for any process. But it's, uh, I mean, just to experiment with it is 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 totally uh, fascinating. It's uh, it's quite something. Yeah, something that I think will probably happen after. If if you think about the the, the what's next, is that once you you implement this type of pattern. Um, you'll start generating data uh, that is um, great for training a model that is um, that is just like bespoke for that solution. So you'll end up kind of training slim, very slim models that can only do one thing, which is like click those three buttons. And I think that's that will be where, where we'll see the cost um, of the, let's say, the entire cost of AI on a company go down is through those mechanisms and i think the you know the fine-tuning apis and the distillation methods that are out there i think we will lead to that so i think it's but it's great that you're capturing that data uh, as a first step you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, it's utterly fascinating. Uh, Pietro, first of all, I want to thank you. I know we've uh, talked here almost an hour, like way too long for a podcast, but it's been super exciting. I'm sure we can do a, a second episode <laughs> and then it will be just fine uh, continuing talking. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for, mm -hmm. for your time. I think this was uh, very insightful. Uh, I, I really think the audience will your, learn from your experience uh, you know, becoming a real digital leader uh, with EQT mm -hmm. and now pushing it even further uh, uh, with AI, automating everything with uh, uh, with Workado. It's uh, uh, thank you, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you another time. Yeah, let's catch up sometime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pietro. Thank you all so much for tuning into today's The New Automation Mindset, where AI automation and integration come together. If you want to learn more about the key topics we've covered in the show, you can find them in the book, The New Automation Mindset by our Workado CEO, Vijay Tella. Also, leave us a comment and let us know what you thought of today's conversations. And don't forget to subscribe so you will never miss an episode. I'll see you next time.